Dismissed. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, good morning. It's good to see you all. If you can open a Bible to Acts chapter 4, that's where we're going to be at together in our time in God's Word. I'll just say, uh, man, leave it up to the Canadian to not care about the Super Bowl. So uh, I love your jersey, Josh. Um, yesterday was an incredible day seeing so many people just serve Jesus by serving one another. Uh, really just warmed my heart. It was such a good day to be here working alongside so many of you. Um, but I did get a lot of uh, Go Chiefs comments. So um, not too happy about that. Um, but nonetheless, I still love you. Um, if you didn't know, uh, there's a football game uh, today called the Super Bowl, and it kind of matters to my family. Um, I have uh, been a 49ers fan since I was like six years old. And um, yeah, so I was born in San Francisco, moved to Montana when I was three. And uh, when I was six, I mean, at that point, I'd spent half my life in San Francisco. And so I would tell all my friends in Little Deer Lodge, Montana, like, I'm from San Francisco, you know. And uh, it was probably because the Niners were really good and also probably because their quarterback was named Joe Montana and I lived in Montana. This is like my developing brain, I think. Um, I just grew up loving watching the 49ers play football. You know, I loved Jerry Rice and Ronnie Lott and all these guys. And uh, it was great to watch. It's fun to watch professionals play a game. And as a kid, you're like, I could do this. I could totally do this. And it didn't hurt that I had no brothers. And so when my dad and I would play football in the front yard, I had no one playing defense on me. And so I scored easily all the time. And so I remember getting to fifth grade and thinking, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to play small fry football. I'm going to put a helmet on, pads on. I'm going to go out there. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be Jerry Rice, you know. And I was probably a week into camp, into all the practices that I came home one day. I sat at the edge of my parents' waterbed, which tells you how old I am. And um, I told my dad, I'm done. I quit. I do not want to do this anymore. I didn't process how hard it was going to be. You know, I didn't process all the running, all the push-ups, you know, all the burpees, all the things. As a little fifth grade boy, I was like, this is not front yard football. This is not fun at all. You know, I just, I hated my life. And then I was realizing even in that moment that there wasn't enough anger inside of me that wanted to hit people so badly, you know. And so they'd always be like doing these tackling drills and I just, I didn't like it. It wasn't that enjoyable for me. And so my dad looked at me though. And he said, well, son, I'll never forget this. He said, son, well, you committed to playing football this season. You have to finish because you committed to it. But after the season's over, you don't have to play football ever again if you don't want to. So that was a, that was a core uh, life lesson for me. I needed to finish what I started. But I also picked up on a pattern that is still with me to this day. And I wonder if it's in your life too. That sometimes we have an idealized version of things and how they're going to go. And then we meet opposition, we meet resistance, we meet hardship, and all of a sudden, we kind of want to reroute where we thought we were going. We, we, we want to do something else, we want to quit, we want to bail, we want to resign. Resistance often leads to resignation. It often leads to us wanting to throw in the towel. I mean, maybe that's how you've experienced your marriage. You stood at the altar and you gave your vows. And then you didn't just hit a speed bump. You felt like your marriage flew off a cliff. And it got really hard, right? Or maybe you had a friendship with somebody. And you thought you were going to be friends forever, but something happened. That got really hard. And now you haven't talked to them in years. We could do this in church life, you know. I'm not saying there's not good reasons to uh, end a relationship ever or something like that. Uh, I'm not saying there's not good reasons to, to join or leave a church or something like that at times. There are good reasons for those kinds of things. But we can sometimes show up at a new church. We go, man, this place is perfect. This is just what I've been looking for. But then after, I don't know, eight weeks, you really start to get to know people or something like that. And then all of a sudden, somebody hurts you. Things aren't as perfect as you thought they maybe were at the surface. 
and you're like, I think I'm going to go look somewhere else again. Right, the moment we often meet resistance or opposition or some form of difficulty, it can cause us to want to throw in the towel. And as we've been going through this series on growing as a church that prays together, that seeks the face of God together, we've looked at Matthew chapter 6, and we've begun last week to look at the book of Acts in these scenes where the church is praying together so that we might learn what it would look like for us to be a praying church. And what we're looking at in Acts chapter 4 is the very first moment of response of God's people to the very first experience of opposition that they face. How are they going to pray? When things start getting tough, what are they going to do? I mean, nothing but great things have been going on. I mean, we saw last week how they prayed and God sent his spirit, right? We, 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 we looked at that prayer of anticipation for God to be at work. And then in Acts chapter 2, God sends the spirit. And we learn that thousands of people repent of their sin and trust in Jesus to save them. 5,000 people get saved. And then Acts chapter 3, we see Peter and John, and they go to the temple to pray and to interact with people. And they see a man sitting there who has not walked his entire life. He's over 40 years old. Right? He's old. Right? Long time. And he goes, hey, can I have some money? And Peter famously says, I don't have any gold or silver, but what I do have I will give to you. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And the guy gets up. And naturally, this creates um, a scene. All these people come flooding in, wondering what happens. And Peter takes that as another opportunity to share the gospel of what Jesus has done in this world. And we learn at the end of chapter 3, essentially, or no, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, that 5,000 people become Christians. Great things are happening. This is better than we could have ever anticipated but they finally meet some opposition. And these religious leaders bring in Peter, they bring in John, they bring in the man who now can walk, and they put him in this courtroom scene, they begin to question them. And clearly they can't even deny what they've seen. They don't like what's happening, they don't want Jesus' resurrection to be proclaimed, they don't like what's going on around them, but they, but they say this in verse 17, this won't be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles open in chapter four, verse 17, or 16, it says, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them. It's evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They're looking at a man who is walking, who has never walked before. And like, there's no question something's going on here. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They give a slap on the wrist. Stop talking about this Jesus. But Peter and John, this is what they said. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They say, you must be quiet. First form of opposition, what will they do? And I want to ask you the question, when you face opposition in this world because of Jesus, what will you do? I'm going to ask you three questions that are raised in our text. The first one is this, where are you going to go? When you face opposition, where will you go? Where will you go? We see where these disciples go. We see in verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends. They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. After this difficult moment, they, I mean, they spent a night in prison, right? They're told to be quiet, no longer speak this name. They go to their friends. They go to their community. It literally says they went to their own. They went to their own. 
The apostles have a community that supports them. Do you see this? They have new friends. These are people that are rejecting them. They're people who they would have wanted to have been insiders with before. But now they're on the outside, but the disciples have a new community that supports them, and they report what has happened. They tell them the story that we just read. This is what happened. I imagine it's how Luke wrote it all down. They tell them the story. They have friends to turn to, and we're going to see in a second, they have friends that are going to seek God's face with them. You guys, the church is meant to be a community of friendship. It's meant to be a community of friendship. People who would never be friends become friends all because of our commonality in Jesus. I mean, all friendship at some point has a commonality with the other person. If you notice, you're friends with people you share a common interest with. C.S. Lewis uh, iconically said, friendship begins when you're talking to somebody and you go, oh, you too? Me too. Right, this idea that we now have something in common. So maybe you're friends with people because you all have toddlers, you know? You're all in the same season of life or you're all single, you know, or you're all newlyweds or you like the same teams or you share the same interests or something like that. You go to the same school even. I don't know, you work in the same place. You have something in common that makes you friends. What's the U2 moment of this book, of the church? Well, it's looking at another person and saying, you know Jesus? I do too. I do too. Look at, look at how transformed this community of friends is. Look at how transformed they are. I mean, when you go to verse 32 of Acts chapter 4, look at what this community of friendship is like. It says, the full number of those who believed, they were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Verse 34, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. And we learn of a man named Barnabas who sells a field and brings it to the apostles and says, hey, I don't really need the field anymore. I'll just sold it. You can have the money and disperse it to people who need this money. I mean, think about the friendship that's being communicated here in this community. People are selling houses and giving the money away. They're not just like downgrading. They're selling their houses and giving the proceeds so that there'd be nobody needy among them. Well, what kind of, do you have a friend who will sell a house for you? I mean, this is remarkable what we're seeing here that these disciples have. They have been transformed by what Jesus has done. It doesn't revolve around their shared interests. It revolves around the person of Jesus. And this, you guys, is huge in the face of opposition. Friends. Friends. I mean, if you think you're going to make it in this life faithfully and follow Jesus to the end... I mean, where are you going to go when opposition comes? Where will you go? I mean, many people fall away from following Jesus because when they meet the resistance, they bail. They don't have anywhere to go. I mean, this is not an insignificant part of the story. I know it's one verse, but this is actually going to develop out in the whole book of Acts, this really big key that when you give your life to Jesus, you and I are to expect opposition, but you are to also know that you are not alone. You are not alone. I mean, when I was in middle school and high school, I felt this acutely, feeling alone in my faith. I mean, you might be there today in your school, in your workplace. I mean, it's hard, right? It can be really hard. I mean, don't you want to be liked by the people around you? I hope, I don't think I'm alone in that, right? You like being liked. You want other people to go, I like you, right? You like that. You, you, you want to be in on the inside, not the outside, don't you? Doesn't that feel normal? I don't know if anybody does, and if you don't want to be liked, I don't know what that says about you. I, I honestly don't. I'm not going to psychoanalyze you right now, but I think most people want to be liked. Most of us do. 
And so we have these two core fears. I fear that people are going to abandon me, and I fear that I'm going to lose my reputation. And did you know that those two core fears that you walk around this world with are fully assuaged in Jesus? I mean, he is the one who was rejected by everybody. He is the one that on the night he went to go be crucified, all of his closest friends abandoned him, denied even knowing him. And then as he hangs on the cross for our sin, the father forsakes him. Why? So that if you know him, you would know that he would never forsake you, that he would always be with you. He is the friend of sinners. You have a friend who is always with you in Jesus. He is also the one who set aside, Philippians 2 says, his reputation and took on flesh so that he could save you, so that you would know that no matter where you're at, no matter how you feel, you know that at least you know in him, you always have a friend. He is the friend of sinners at all times, but you also have friends in this church. You have friends in the church. You just have to keep showing up. You have to keep showing up. Guys, there might be, I mean, there's a lot of us that are new here at the church, and I know friendship maybe isn't experienced by you yet, and I just want to encourage you, friendship is never created through passivity. It's created through presence. If you want to grow in friendship with people, you have to keep showing up. Just keep showing up and show up and show up, and one day you'll look around and you're like, man, I got some friends. Some that might even sell a house for me. Right? That's what Jesus will do. So where will you go? Where will you go? What do these friends do together? Do they just look at Peter and John and they go, that's a really cool story. Wow. That's fun. Nope. Do they go, that's really encouraging. That's so encouraging. That's not what they say. Do they say, I'll keep praying for you guys. Keep getting them, right? Keep going. They don't say that either. What do they do? They pray together. They cry out to God together. Why do they pray? Why do they pray? That's the second question I want to ask you. Why do we pray? Why do you pray? We see in verses 24 through 28, what drives them to prayer? It says, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. This is Psalm 2 that Hans preached on a couple of weeks ago, which that wasn't planned. I, just, I was like, well, I'm already planning to preach this. I'm going to keep doing this text anyways, you guys. So Psalm 2, this is what we quoted a couple of weeks ago. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. That's who Psalm 2 is talking about, we learn here. Whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The moment that the church first met opposition, what do they do? They pray. They pray. Together, together. They lift up their voices together. It doesn't mean they like wrote down a prayer and they all read it out loud together. It doesn't mean they memorized a prayer and they all said it out loud together. Most likely, it means somebody prayed and together their hearts joined together with that prayer. And as they were moving along and following that prayer, they're going inside, amen, yes, amen, amen. Do you see their togetherness? That's a big, big part of our text. They lifted their voices together. They are together. They are unified. But also look at the opposition that they've met. They're together with somebody else too, right? The, the, the whole world is together against, they don't see it as against them, but against Jesus. Together against Jesus. Guys, there are um, two teams in this world. There is team Jesus, and there is team against Jesus. And sure, I, I'm, if you're here and you're not a Christian, 
I'm really glad that you're here. And you might have this sense of like, I don't really feel like I'm against Jesus. That feels too strong for how I feel. And I understand what you mean. I've been there before. But there, there might be different shapes and colors and whatevers of people who are against Jesus. But it all boils down to this. You are going to be ruled by somebody, even if that person is you. And so you might not think you're against Jesus today, but if you're the one who wants to rule your life and Jesus has come that he might rule you and that you would come under his good and gracious and wise rule, at some point you are going to resist. At some point you are going to resist. There is team Jesus and team the world and so these people understand this and so they pray. They pray. Why do they pray? The shorthand answer to that is they pray because God reigns. They pray because God reigns. They say, sovereign Lord, literally masters. The only time this word ever comes up in the book of Acts. They call out to the God who is their master. He's ruling them. He's leading them. And then they, um, you know, uh, look at his creation who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. God is the one who creates and controls geography and he will overhaul this earth by the power of his spirit. They know, they're seeing, they know their conflict is placed into the hands of God. They know this. But they see in light of that, that all these threats, all this opposition, it's completely in vain. They're seeing here that persecution, that them being persecuted is a part of Scripture's promise, that this is going to happen and that they should not be discouraged. I mean, look at verse 28 again. God is going to do whatever his hand and his plan has predestined to take place. Powerful people might warn you. Powerful people might threaten you. Powerful people might set out new rules to try to silence you but those powerful people's authority is still subject to God and no one can overturn his plans. This is their understanding of who God is. He is a creator, he's a a speaking God. He reveals himself and he's the God of all history. He didn't just show up yesterday. He's been around for every single thing that's ever taken place on the planet and he knows the beginning from the end. We see it in verse 24. You made, verse 25, you spoke, verse 28, you decided, God. This is all you, and this is why we pray, right? Because Jesus is both a great savior and he's the greatest king. He's the greatest king. I want you to think about this. This will drive you to prayer, you guys. Uh, Barbara Boyd, um, she's the great InterVarsity um, Bible teacher of the 50s and 60s. I don't know if you've heard of her before, but shout out InterVarsity. I don't know if Natalia is here. But uh, uh, UC San Bernardino, right, InterVarsity. But um, she talked about this all the time, that Jesus is this great sovereign creator. And she wanted that to sink into her people, her students, to see that 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 should drive you to prayer, it should drive you to go in all these things. And she used this example, I think it's helpful. She said, I want you to imagine the distance between the earth and the sun, which is 92 million miles, was the thickness of one sheet of paper, right? The, the, The distance from the earth to the sun, 92 million miles. Let's just say, relatively, that's the distance of this piece of paper. She said, the distance between the earth and the nearest star, the earth and the earth's star would be a stack of papers 71 feet high. Uh, I'm not in construction. I don't know. That's probably at least to the ceiling or something. I don't know. Maybe I can't count. It's a really tall piece, stack of paper, you guys, okay? From the earth to the nearest star. If you were to measure the distance of our galaxy, it is 310 miles high stack of paper. That's from here to Phoenix, A stack of paper 310 miles high from here to Phoenix is the distance of our galaxy in scope. And our galaxy is just like a speck in all the universe, right? Just a speck. And according to the Bible, 
God is the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in those things. Jesus is the one who holds the universe together by the word of his power and he came and he died for you. That's not the person that I pray to and ask to come into my life to be my personal assistant. That's not the person I pray to to come into my life from time to time to consult things for me. And I go, "Ah, I don't really like that idea. All right, thank you for coming. No, no, no. You take all your allegiances, all your limits off your allegiance to him. He is the sovereign king. This is why we pray, because Jesus reigns over all things. Knowing that, what are you going to pray for? What are you going to pray for? What are you going to pray for? Verse 29, and now, Lord, they finally get to their request, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus and when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They haven't asked for anything yet until verse 29. They just brought to their minds the truth about who God is. And I've thought about this off and on all week. After going through what they went through, I wonder what I would have prayed for. I wonder what I would have prayed for. Like if we were to fill in the blank, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants, what would you have prayed for? What would your request be? What would you say? I know what my, um, my little girl Isla would have prayed for. I know for without a shadow of a doubt. Um, every night, um, I'll often go around and tuck all my kids into bed and uh, we'll pray individually with each of them, you know? And some nights they pray, some nights I pray, and I love hearing how they pray. It's, they're all so different, you know? But every night, Isla, when she prays, and now she's at the point where if I pray, she's like, can I still pray? And I'm like, sure, you can pray. And we know what she's going to pray for. Every single night, she is going to pray that she sleeps safely, that nobody gets hurt tomorrow, that everybody gets better, and that everybody is safe tomorrow. Right? That we would all be safe. That we would all be safe. That, that's her prayer every single night, and it's precious it's precious to me. I'm not sure that I'm, most, I'm very different than Isla is on many days. I'm pretty sure that her prayer is probably reflective in most of our prayers as well. I mean, could you imagine verse 29? This is kind of what I would expect. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants, Lord, please keep us safe. Would you keep Peter and John safe? Would you keep us safe? Lord, would you keep us safe? Safety is a great thing, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't want to be safe? I mean, we have good desires to live in a safe city. We want to be safe, so we lock our doors at night. Right? We have cameras now outside of our properties. We lock our doors even during the day. Okay? I'll leave my house and 30 seconds later, forget something, go back in. My wife has already locked the door. Okay? Okay? So I'm now a guest in my house again, you know? We're so thankful for all of our police officers that patrol our city and keep us safe. Our desire to be safe is innate. It's a good desire. There's nothing wrong with that desire. But it can become an idol. It can become the highest good to us. It can become the trump card in our decision-making that we will not do anything unless it is safe. Guys, the highest ambition that we often have is to safely enjoy our lives. This is what we saw in the disciples before they were crucified, before he was crucified. But when we are saved and Jesus sends the spirit to live in our lives, 
we get a whole new holy ambition that dethrones safety as our highest ambition. So what do they pray for? They don't pray for safety. Do they pray for favor? They don't pray for favor. Do they pray for more converts? They don't even technically do that. They pray for boldness. They were already so bold though. Why would you pray for boldness? But you see, they realized their boldness did not come from them. Their boldness came from God. It came from God. But see, boldness is not rudeness. Boldness is not a thick-headedness without a concern for other people. It is an unwavering, holy ambition in the face of opposition. You could summarize boldness by saying it's an unwavering love for God and others in the face of opposition. They will not be silent about what they've seen and what they've experienced. And they know they need God to give them more boldness because the persecution is only going to get worse from here on out. I mean, I'm curious, if you, if you can't endure shushing persecution, how will you endure death? How will you endure imprisonment? Or they don't pray that God would laugh at these people or terrify them or break them into pieces, all things that Psalm 2 says, but they pray for courage that they would keep spreading the message. Right? In combination with this good news going out, notice too there's going to be these good deeds that are going to be done as well. And then in light of their prayer, verse 31 shows them that God is still with them. God is still listening. The place is shaken as they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And as John Chrysostom said, the place was shaken, but that made them all the more unshaken. All the more unshaken. Guys, the Spirit is not a thing. It's not a thing, right? This is God giving himself to his people in a fresh way. They're not just living off their faith from Pentecost. There is a freshness to their faith, a freshness to their experiencing of God now, right here, right now. But notice the big change. The bug is caught because Peter and John are not just the ones that are the bold ones. These aren't just friends that go, you're doing great, keep it up, we're going to chill here, okay? No, it says they were all filled with the word of God with boldness. They continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Everyone is doing this now. Jesus promised this, that the Spirit would empower them to be his witnesses, even if that meant risking their own life. And so if they're told, you cannot speak the name of Jesus anymore, they're like, well, this is my purpose in life. This is what I've seen. This is what I've known. This is what I've experienced. You cannot keep me silent. Right? This has always been the testimony of Christians. Anytime the Spirit comes upon people, it gives you boldness to share the message of what Jesus has done. And this has happened throughout the history of our world. I mean, I think of so many martyrs, so many Christians who have gone to the brink of death itself because they couldn't be silent about Jesus. I think of Lambert, who was a, a martyr under King Henry VIII while he was cruelly mangled by people. And he was consumed in a slow fire. He raised his burning hands amid the flames with a distinct voice and said, none but Christ, none but Christ. I think of William Tyndale, who died in 1536 at the very old age of 42 because he was translating the Bible from the original Greek and Hebrew text into the common English language. Do you realize you're, the Bible that you're holding, someone died. They didn't just sell their house. They died so that we could have this today. Isn't that amazing? He was killed for doing that. And as he was dying at the stake, his body being burned, his final words before his death were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. That's what he prayed. Within four years of his death, that same king who ordered him to be put to death ordered the publication of four English translations based largely on his own work. God answers that prayer. When I was in Birmingham, England, visiting some missionaries, one night I went on a walk and I saw a plaque of a guy named John Rogers who died in 1555, and it just said, John Rogers burnt at the stake for helping translate the Bible into English. 
He was the first martyr under Bloody Mary. Lawrence Saunders, another one who suffered under Bloody Mary, he kissed the stake that he was bound to, and he cried out loud, Welcome to the cross of Christ. Welcome to the cross of Christ. Welcome to life everlasting. These are all people who are just following in the footsteps of what we're going to see in Acts chapter 7 of Stephen, the very first martyr, who wasn't just shushed and said, don't talk about Jesus anymore. He was killed. And as he's dying, he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Do not hold this sin against them. We are told that Jesus or Stephen looks into heaven. And what does he see? The glory of God and Jesus standing at the Father's side. He knows Jesus reigns. Right, so what would make us into that kind of person? Right, what would make us into Acts 4 kind of people? Well, where do you get boldness like that? Because I do know that we won't get that kind of boldness from the American dream. I mean, people call us to live these like cookie cutter lives. We're told we're supposed to have a nice upbringing, go to a good school, have a lot of fun, but study hard, get a good degree, get settled into your career, maybe do some further education, don't forget to get married and start a family, go to all the soccer practices, right? Raise those kids well. Hopefully they're pretty moral pay for their college, plan for retirement, and then relax because you've worked hard. That's the dream. But the gospel is like a stick of dynamite that blows up those dreams and says the bake sale is over. Right? I mean, Jesus is the king on the throne, and he is worth everything, and he has called me his friend. And he's given me friends and his family so game on, right? I mean, we can risk the most because we know the end is sure. We know, as we saw in Acts 1, he is coming back. He's coming again. So we pray. So we pray. We pray for boldness. I mean, we, we know the end, and that's exactly, I'll put it this way, that's the reason why there are sports fans in this world is because we don't know the future, Right? That's why there's, re there's reason there's 49ers fans today and Chiefs fans. If you could tell me the Niners would not win today and they would never win a game for the rest of their existence, I'm sorry, but like, I'm probably out. I'm like, what are we doing? If you knew your team was never going to win, like, why would you do that? Not knowing makes you invest. But what if you knew? What if you knew? How much would you invest? Guys, a praying church prays and then lives to the great end and aim for life of what we're seeing in our passage. God will build his church in the face of opposition because Jesus reigns. Because he reigns. If Jesus' glory is the glory that I care about in this world, then the cookie cutter bake sale is over. And I'm praying for boldness. We pray for boldness. A praying church, we don't pursue the cookie cutter life. We, we pursue Jesus' life in this world, which is a bold life. Because we will meet opposition. But we know, we know where he sits. And so we pray because we need him to make us bold, because that won't come from within. We pray together with our new friends, because Jesus has made us some promises, and we know he has the power to keep them. Let's all pray.